Regional Economic Integration, Chapter 9. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, how countries work together through various forms of economic integration to create agreements to help increase the flow of trade and reduce trade barriers um, for, for the benefit of all countries involved. And over the last um, 20, 30 years, this has really been uh, an area of much progress and development. Uh, here are the levels of integration from the free trade area, which would be the least integrated, to a political union, which would be the most integrated. Okay, So a free trade area is something we have with Mexico and Canada. And this is going to um, eliminate all the barriers of trades for trade um, um, among the countries involved. Um, so it's a free trade area where there's neither the, none of the countries involved can put up any tariffs, quotas, subsidies, or administrative impediments. Um, they are still allowed to make their own political or um, economic and trade policies with countries outside of the, the free trade area, but with inside the free trade area, they are not allowed to influence a trade among the countries within the free trade area. So, and of course, uh, NAFTA is the one we're most familiar with, and you know we have established free trade with Canada and Mexico, but we don't have a, um, a customs union or a common market or an economic in union or a political union with these countries. We just have a free trade area where, basically, with minimal uh, with some exceptions, but for the most part, goods are free to trade between the three countries. Now, if we look at the next area, customs union. Let's see, sorry. Going backwards. Okay, customs union. Um, this is going to eliminate the trade barriers between the member countries and adopt uh, a universal external trade policy. So not only are they going to eliminate... Um, uh, trade barriers internally, they're also going to set a common external, which is a little bit more integrated of a policy for all member countries. So this is going to require more administrative um, oversight to oversee trade relations with non-members. Uh, most countries that enter into a customs union desire even greater economic integration down the road, and the, the European Union began as a customs union, and it has moved um, you know, er, uh, into more of an economic uh, union, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay, uh, common market. So uh, the next level uh, up would be a common market, and the common market has no barriers to trade among the member countries. Includes a common external trade policy and allows factors of production to move freely among members, uh, labor and capital are free to move because there is no restrictions on immigration, emigration, the cross-border flow of capital among member countries. So money and people can move freely among uh, the member countries without having to um, you know, get special permissions or documents or visas, uh, things of that nature. nature. Uh, so establishing a common market demands a significant degree of, of uh, cooperation on fiscal, monetary, employment, um, employment policies and achie achieving this cooperation has proven very difficult for many countries. The, Euro the European Union um, has functioned as a common market um, and it's moved beyond it. The uh, South America grouping of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay and Uruguay um, hopes to eventually establish itself as a common market but they're having some problems um, with that because it's a difficult thing to set up. Just like you said, um, difficult to achieve, um, but uh, can be very beneficial for the growth of the economy by allowing money and people to move to where it's most can be most useful. Okay, economic union uh, is even a higher level of integration, and the economic union involves the free flow of uh, products, uh, factors of production among the member countries, and the um, adoption of a common external trade policy and it also requires a, a common currency sort of like the euro um, 
an alignment of tax rates and uh, common monetary and fiscal policy. So such a high degree of integration demands uh, a coordinating bureaucracy that has to be set up. Uh, and in individual uh, member countries are going to have to uh, sacrifice uh, some amounts of national sovereignty um, to this new organization. And we can see a lot of that happening in the European Union over the past 20 years. Um, it's not a com you know it's not a co complete economic union, but it, it's getting pretty close. And some member um, associated countries like England have opted to stay out of the currency because of the they don't want to give up control of their po their currency policies. And you know that move may have been smart in light of what's happening in Greece and Spain. Um, so the next level up from here. Uh, would be a political union. So a political union um, in which centralized political um, government is formed that coordinates economic, social, and foreign policy for all member states. And the EU is heading towards um, a, somewhat of a political union. Um, the Europe, they have a European Parliament which is uh, playing an ever more important role in the EU and has been uh, has been you know directly elected by the citizens of EU countries since the late 1970s. Um, so the EU has been moving closer to this. Uh, now the United States is actually a good example of a political union because the United States is made up of independent states that have come together under a single nation, under a single currency, and have submitted many of their state rights to the federal government structure. So that would be, the United States would be an example of a political union where each state potentially could have been its own country. In fact, one state in the union, Texas, was its own sovereign nation at one point. Um, so, but these country, these states band together to create uh, a stronger political union. And you can see the United States is a much stronger country as 50 states rather than 50 separate countries in some sort of economic or common market. You know, and a lot of people see the success of the United States in the, as an example uh, that I think the EU is trying to follow and heading towards that uh, political union. But it's going to be much more difficult for the EU to become as integrated as the United States because of the vast diversity of their cultures and background and histories uh, that Europe has. Now, so let's think about political integration. Is this the right thing to do? Is this a benefit? Are there drawbacks, you know, you know, we should take close, you know, con thought and consideration. Um, now, the political case for, should I talk about the political case? Uh, let's take a step back. Okay, so. I think we can all agree that um, free trade in, uh, is a good thing for the world. And these regional integrations are some of the small steps countries can take until we get to, I guess, the ultimate goal of a total free market world trade for the entire world, where every country is involved in a at least a free trade area with every other country on Earth, um, allowing trade to be unregulated and to be... Uh, a free-flowing entity that is unaffected by governmental elections or, or concerns or you know short-term thinking you know um, so generally the case for it is that if we do have these this political this regional integration things will be better economically and that's why countries generally um, want to do this but there are always groups that oppose the economic integration uh, based on fear of losing their job or an uh, independence of the country or many other uh, uh, things can get involved now um, if we look at NAFTA there was a lot a concern about NAFTA you know there was Ross Perot famously said there'd be a big giant sucking sound of all the jobs being sucked into Mexico uh, once a free trade agreement was established and only American factories would close and everything would move to Mexico. Um, there's been a lot of concern about um, 
that the free trade agreement with Mexico would uh, enc encourage more uh, illegal immigration, encourage more gangs, encourage more drug trade, um, you know, and it would be uh, in total a disaster for the United States. You know, um, NAFTA has been in place for at least 20 years, and um, it seems to have been, none of those fears have really seemed to come true, uh, completely, maybe partially, but, you know, the United States did not lose all their jobs to Mexico, and the United States did not go into an economic tailspin. Um, but there is, you know, there was a huge amount of concern over NAFTA. If we look at the case for economic integration, um, so, you know, regionally economies could thrive if, you know, the trade is allowed to be more integrated. Um, well, at least that's the idea. Um, and the result would be greater production that would be possible with the trade restrictions for each country. Now, uh, the absence of barriers uh, and the increase of the free flow of goods and services and factors of production among nations would be uh, economically, based on economic theory that we talked in previous chapters, this should be a good thing. Um, so, you know, this uh, economic, the regional economic integration can be seen as an attempt to achieve additional gains from the free flow of trade and investment between countries uh, uh, beyond those attainable by uh, international agreements. So this is sort of a step up where we can level the efficiency, NAFTA can level the efficiency of the North American continent rather than um, just each of the three countries in the agreement going it by themselves and having to deal with everything as an individual nation. So it was um, meant to increase the economies of all three countries. And all three countries' economies have been increased greatly. Uh, and much of that can be contributed to the free trade agreement. Now, if we look at a political case uh, for, for economic integration, um, there, you know, there have been many attempts um, to establish free trade areas and custom unions and things like this, uh, uh, putting together uh, geographically close, close economies and making them increasingly uh, dependent on each other, uh, and creating incentive for political cooperation between neighboring states, and um, and hopefully reducing uh, political uh, violent conflict among countries. Um, so the idea is that, you know, if we could come together more of a, an economic and, um, integration and trade integration, then we'll be less likely to establish hostilities against each other. And I guess Europe is an example where there was many, many hostilities on the continent and through the, um, their closer ties, through their economic pacts and trade, trade agreements, they've become a more peaceful continent. At least that's some, somewhat of the theory. Um, but <coughs> there is a case for countries uh, politically to, you know, if, if countries can politically be stronger in their region, then they can be stronger internationally. And Europe was, you know, looking at if we could be more regionally integrated and we can be more efficient, we could compete against the United States and China more easily. Um, now, there is some impedance to achieving and maintaining these economic integrations. Um, and one, it could be costly. Um, because, you know, there is a lot at stake when, you know, a country's, you know, um, get involved in something like NAFTA. Uh, you know, while a nation as a whole may benefit significantly from a regional trade agreement, certain groups may lose. Um, and moving to a free trade agreement involves painful adjustments. You know, uh, for example, in 1994, the establishment of NAFTA, some Canadians and U.S. workers, uh, especially in industries as textiles and some low-cost, low-skilled manufacturing uh Lost, lost their jobs as Canada and U.S. firms moved production to Mexico. So that, that was a fact and it did happen, but not all the jobs. But some jobs did shift because of the lower um, wages that were paid in Mexico. 
Uh, but if some of these jobs move to Mexico, uh, this was supposed to help increase the pay and the middle class in Mexico, and they could buy more products from the United States and Canada, helping to hire and increase employment in other areas of the country. But these train these these um, these changes are often difficult to go through at first, and sometimes you can't see the immediate benefits till many years later. Uh, now, the second impediment to integration could be the concerns of losing national sovereignty. Uh, Mexico's concerns about maintaining control of its oil interests resulted in an agreement with Canada and the United States to exempt the Mexican oil industry from um, liberalization of foreign investment regulations achieved under NAFTA. Now it turns out that Mexico should not have had this fear and they should have um, allowed their oil industry to be more opened up to investment uh, and, and, and private ownership of foreign countries from uh, companies from Canada and the United States because it turns out that right now their oil industry is really in a bad shape due to lack of investment, political squandering of the, of the profits that their national oil industry has made, and just plain out mismanagement of the government trying to run their oil industry. So they really uh, should have let that fall under NAFTA, and they probably they would have been definitely better off and, about, and would have been producing much more oil today, and the government could have collected a lot more tax on that and not have to have been bothered trying to run. And in fact, the oil industry in Mexico is so strong, it actually um, has a huge influence on the politics of Mexico and uh, the government of Mexico. So, you know, that's the case of that governmental association control of the oil industry is really holding Mexico back. <clears throat> um, and, you know, the European Union has had some, uh, some problems to integration, especially in this area of fear of loss of national sovereignty. And we've seen that, um, you know, that countries, when they have a crisis, such as in Greece or Spain, um, that, you know, when they have to work together, it's hard for a country like Greece to take orders or suggestions from Germany. You know, there's the nationalism, you know, they, they can't get as integrated when they're still holding on to their national sovereignty and not really, they're putting their individual country first rather than the economic union. So it's a difficult thing to achieve. <clears throat> Um, now, if we look at a case against uh, regional integration, um, even though regional integration has been heating up and there are a lot of free trade agreements and, over the years, some economists have expressed a concern that the benefits from regional integration have been, you know, overpromised and that the costs are often been understated or ignored. They point out that the benefits of regional integration are determined by the extent of trade creation as opposed to trade um, diversion. So trade creation occurs when high cost domestic uh, producers are replaced by low cost uh, producers within a trade, uh, the free trade area. It may also occur when high cost external producers are replaced by low cost external producers within the free trade area as well. So trade diversion occurs uh, when low cost external suppliers are replaced by high cost suppliers within the um, free trade area. So that would be a bad thing because if we had um, you know, low cost external suppliers, that's keeping inflation down. And if we're replacing them by high cost suppliers within the trade area, that's really working against free trade. So a regional trade agreement uh, will benefit the world only if uh, uh, the amount of trade it creates exceeds the amount that it diverts. So, you know, suppose the United States and Mexico impose tariffs on importing from all countries and they set up a free trade area, scrapping all trade barriers between themselves but maintaining trade uh, tariffs on imports from the rest of the world. So if the Mexican, uh, if the United States began to import textiles from Mexico, would this change, would this benefit be for the better. The United States previously, you know, produced all its own textiles at a higher cost than Mexico. Then the free trade agreement has shifted the production to Mexico. Of course, this is going to, um, according to the, you know, comparative advantage, this trade would, um, 
you know, has been created with, within the regional grouping, and there would be no decrease in trade with the rest of the world. But clearly, um, the change would be for the better. However, if the United States previously imported textiles from Costa Rica, um, then producing them more, which could produce them more cheaply than Mexico or in the United States, then the trade has been diverted from a low-cost country like uh, Costa Rica into Mexico, which means overall we'll be paying more. So if we're just diverting, um, you know, this is sort of the case for a worldwide free trade agreement because regionally if these free trade agreements are set up and then we just turn around and we um, are circumventing uh, lower-cost suppliers from somewhere else in the world, then, we're, then the economy really isn't winning at all. Now, um, Europe actually has two trade blocks, the European Union with 27 members and the European Free Trade Association with uh, four members. And the European Union is expected to become, um, if they can work out their problems and get through the economic stumbling blocks they're currently under and come closer to a political union, they're expected to become you know, a superpower uh, at the same economic level of the United States and China. So let's talk a little bit more about the European Union. Um, so the Europe was, both world wars were center stage in Europe um, and devastated their economies, devastated their um, political structures devastated their populations and there was a desire for peace um, and there was a desire to come together more politically and economically um, to avoid um, further uh, hostile outbreaks you know and become a more successful continent so um, the EU took slow steps in becoming more integrated um, you know, forming a coal and steel community, establishing an economic community. Um, and here, here's a map of the countries that are in the economic union. In, you know, the the um, mustard colored countries are part of the, the European Union. The green countries are non-members of the European Union and the orange companies are applying uh, for membership. So you can see that Iceland and Norway, uh, Ukraine, uh, these countries are right now uh, non-members, but could be members in the future, possibly. Okay. So as far as the political structure of the EU, they have four main institutions. A European Commission, Council of, um, which proposes legislation, implements the legislation, monitors compliance. Council of European Union, that's controlling authority within the EU, a European Parliament, which you know, sort of like a Congress debates legis uh, legislation, proposes commissions, um, and forwards forwards it to the Council, and a Court of Justice, uh, which is sort of the Supreme Court of Europe in dealing with EU law and things of that nature. Um, now, in 1987, they came out with the Single European Act. Uh, committing these countries to work together to establish a single European market by 1992. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to remove um, the frontier controls between EU countries. They wanted to apply um, mutual recognition of product standards and specifications and safety concerns. Um, they wanted to have uh, procurement for non-national suppliers. Uh, lift trade barriers uh, in banking and insurance and remove all restrictions on foreign trade transactions among member countries. So that was their goal uh, and, and abolish uh, restrictions on um, cabotage. Uh, and this is the right of foreign truckers to pick up and deliver goods within, uh, an, um, within another member state borders. And it um, Now, uh, in 91, they established basically what is known as the euro. 
uh, and 17 of the 27 member states became part of this Eurozone where they agreed to give up control of their monetary policy and have all adapt a single currency. And there are some benefits and drawbacks to this. I guess one of the drawbacks is some of the weaker EU countries having finally gotten involved with a stronger currency. In the past, a country like Greece or Spain or Italy had currencies that weren't as strong and had higher inflation and it was difficult for them to really um, borrow enough of their domestic currency um, to transact in the world markets. Uh, now once they got, being, once they became part of the economic uh, union and part of the euro, they suddenly had a very strong low inflation, high value currency and the first thing uh, some of these countries did was went out and borrowed lots of money against this currency which they could get at low rates and the government could reinvest um, and that but that led to ballooning budget deficits which is leads up to some of the problems we had today and not all the countries were thrilled about this and many of the countries opted to stay out of um, the eurozone specifically the biggest country and the biggest disappointment to them would be Britain which is the one of the financial capitals of Europe so the benefits of the euro, uh, think of sort of like the benefits of the U.S. dollar inside the United States. One currency, what would it be like if every state in the United States had their own currency? And every time you went between uh, states in the United States, you had to exchange your currencies. It would be a nightmare. So it's easier to compare prices, promotes competition and efficiency. Um, you know, it can also become... A, uh, a substitute world currency and then that would bring additional money into the Union uh, so there are a lot of benefits to establishing the euro and, but it is costly not it's of course costly to replace everyone's currency with a new currency that's just the physical uh, and locational costs um, you know but the um, you, the member countries lose control over the monetary policy. So Greece, uh, they could have used monetary policy to help their current economic situation, but they're not. They can't because they they lost that ability. So it's very difficult for uh, a continent like Europe to have uh, a single currency policy and an exchange rate when you have such vastly different economic and um, political areas with inside of the EU. And we see those problems happening in Spain in Greece today as you know a drawback of the establishment of the euro and the cost. Um, now it's, it's, it's had a pretty volatile trade history as far as the foreign currency value of the euro with the US. At one point it was on parity and um, as the US had problems the euro strengthened to over $1.50 and it since have come down a bit today. So the dollar and the euro have depending on Right now, the dollar is strengthening, the euro is weakening based on the stronger U.S. economy and weaker uh, European economy. So there, you know, has been a lot of trade volatility between the two uh, currencies. Now, the EU is looking to expand, and um, let's see. so there there are ten countries to join in 2004. Um, and they have a population of 450 million people within the EU and a gross domestic product of 11 tr trillion euros. Um, you know, so uh, that's been a major issue facing the EU over the past few years has been this um, enlargement, enlargement of the EU into Eastern Europe um, due to the collapse of communism. Um, you know, that's been a hard you know, you're basically integrating less economically strong countries. Um, you know, who there are still countries looking to join the EU, but the EU has to make sure that these countries have a certain, um, meet certain criteria before they can let them into the, Europe, the European Union. So, um, you know, they do like them to adopt the euro, meet certain, there's a whole list of requirements that they'd have to meet before they can be uh, considered to come part, become part of the larger EU. And the EU has steps in uh, integrating them and making them, um, you know, stronger. 
Uh, now, you take a country like Turkey has been a long time lobbying to join the union, uh, but has many difficult issues. The country has uh, a customs union within the EU, uh, and half of its international trade is already established with the EU, with Turkey as sort of the country that, bought, that connects Europe to Asia. Uh, however, full membership has been denied because of concerns over human rights issues, um, especially with uh, Turkey's the Turkish policies towards the Kurdish minority. In addition, um, on, on, on the Turk side, support of the EU is not eager. Um, you know, they're suspect of the EU n not, you know, being a little prejudiced about allowing a primarily Muslim nation of 74 million people um, to be part of the economic, the EU. Um, you know, but this is something that they're both still working towards and may become a reality soon once they kind of work out these differences. So let's move over to a continent you're a little bit more familiar with, um, the NAFTA, or the Free Trade Agreement. Um, well, you know, there's more than one free trade agreement in the, in the Americas, no, North and South. Um, and with also attempts to make a, a free trade agreement between all of North America and South America called the Free Trade Area of Americas. So here is the um, how it kind of is put together. We have in the purple area, we have NAFTA. And in the green area, the, we have the Moncosur and the orange area of Central America. And then we also have the Caribbean community, so which includes a couple of uh, Gia, um, Guyana in there, which is part of the South American continent. Uh, so this is sort of how we fall out today. So if we look at NAFTA, um, a couple of main points of the, Na the, the NAFTA, it involves three countries, U.S., Canada, and Mexico, abolishes all tariffs on 99% of the goods traded among these countries, uh, removes most barriers of cross-border flow of services, uh, allowing financial institutions, for example, to restrict access to the Mexican market, um, protection of intellectual properties, removal of most restrictions on foreign direct investment among the three member countries. Um, although special treatment protection is given to Mexican energy, and uh, railway industries, American airlines, and radio communication industries, and Canadian culture. Uh, application of national environmental standards provides uh, such standards have a scientific basis. Lowering standards to, um, to lower investment is described as being inappropriate. So um, when they say those internet, um, environmental standards, a basis, a scientific, uh, must have a scientific basis. That was a little uh, jab at the um, political climate around climate change. Uh, thinking uh, at the beginning of climate change in the 90s, they said there was not any scientific uh, backing for it, so no legislation was going to be created. Although today, that is universally, that thought is universally changed. Uh, also, the establishment of two uh, commissions with the power to uh, impose fines and, and remove trade privileges when environmental standards or legislations involving health and, health and safety, minimum wage, or child labor are ignored. Okay, so what are, what are the benefits for NAFTA? Well, for Mexico, they, have, they get increased jobs uh, as lower cost production moves uh, to Mexico and more rapid economic growth. Uh, for the U.S. and Canada, access to um, a large and increasingly uh, prosperous market, lower prices for consumer goods produced in Mexico. Uh, U.S. and Canada firms with production sites in Mexico are more competitive in world markets. So it's sort of keeping the production a little bit closer and more of the money in North America rather than um, moving those factories to Asia, which NAFTA really didn't stop that either. Many of the many countries opted to move factories to, to Vietnam and China and parts of Asia for even lower cost um, production. Um, now, I mean, 
NAFTA has been viewed as a way, this free trade area should be viewed as an opportunity to create an enlargement and more effective um, production base for the entire region. Um, and so each country would benefit a little bit differently, but the idea is that without, you know, the legal and political paperwork of trade um, restrictions, the countries, the three countries should have a greater activity in trade areas. And that actually did happen. So NAFTA is uh, universally thought of as a success. There have been minor setbacks and, and problems with NAFTA, but overall it did greatly increase the economies of all three countries involved. But the drawbacks, it was painful to lose jobs um, in, in the United States and wage levels did decline in the US and Canada uh, and unions lost some power because of this. Uh, Mexican workers were, giving, were given actually special visas and privileges to work and uh, immigrate north. Um, but once their work is completed, they were expected to go back to Mexico. Uh, pollution would increase due to more uh, manufacturing in Mexico and uh, their less stringent and regulated pollution standards. So those are some of the drawbacks. And, you know, Mexico would lose some sovereignty as they would have to give up uh, um, certain controls over their industries um, that previously the government was enjoying. So like I said before, uh, NAFTA has been successful. Um, the trade between the countries increased by 250%. Um, the three countries are more closely integrated. Uh, production has increased in actually all member nations. Uh, the employment effect has been much smaller than it was feared. And Mexico has become more politically stable. And actually, th uh, this year, Mexico's economy has grown quite strongly, uh, even though there is, we hear a lot of negativity from Mexico about drugs and drug cartels and things of that nature. But um, Mexico has a, a lot of um, positive things happening uh, in their country over the past five years specifically. Now, uh, if we look at another uh, pact, you know, which involves more South American countries, um, the Andean community, uh, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru signed an agreement in 69 to create uh, this pact and it's largely based on the EU model and they basically don't want to be left behind. So they're trying to create a uh, similar uh, union of South American countries to help develop and uh, expand trade. Now let's move on to something a little bit more progressive is, you know, the Free Trade a Act of the Americas established in 2005. Um, now um, the U.S. and Brazil have limited support for this agreement, uh, but if it was established, it would create a free trade area of 850 million people between North and South America. So. Um, it took more than three years for the talks to start, um, you know, but in April 1998, 38 heads of state traveled to Chile for a summit of the Americas where they formally started talks on FTAA. Um, the, uh, the continued talks have addressed a wide range of economic, political, environmental issues related to cross-border trade and investment. And although the United States, Brazil, um, are, they advocate that the FTAA, you know, is a good thing, uh, support from both countries have been mixed at certain points because the United States and Brazil have the largest economies in North and South America, respectively. Strong U.S.-Brazilian support is really a precondition for the establishment of this free trade area. Um, the major stumbling blocks so far have been twofold. First, the United States wants its southern neighbors to agree to tougher enforcement of intellectual property rights and lower manufacturing tariffs. Uh, which, they, which they do not seem very eager to want to embrace. Secondly, Br Brazil and Argentina want the United States to reduce subsidies on agricultural products uh, and scrap tariffs on agricultural imports, which the U.S. does not really seem inclined to do. You have to remember, the United States uh, 
throws a lot of money and support into the agricultural industry. One of the reasons soy and corn and wheat are so cheap in this country and our food products, which mostly contain soy, soy, um, soy, corn and wheat are so inexpensive is because the government puts a lot of subsidies in to keep these, this food inflation down and, and, and um, protect the local farmers. And they don't, you know, it's very difficult uh, for the various political lobbies to want to change that. Um, so United States and Brazil have to really reach agreements on these critical issues before FTAA can eventually be established. But um, there's still a work in progress and there's still a lot of interest in this and it's still alive. So, you know, we'll see what happens with it. I think it would be a good thing. It would be an interesting thing to study and see how that develops. Um, elsewhere in the world, there are other economic uh, integrations, you know, in other parts of the country. Um, not the country, the whole world. A scene would be, um, you know, South Asian nations um, coming together for a, tr a free trade area. Um, which is a, you know, would be a little bit stronger, a lot stronger if it included China, but it doesn't include China. It's more of the countries, uh, most of the countries between China and Australia. Uh, but it's an important and, uh, so, and a somewhat successful uh, free trade uh, area. The uh, APEC, which is the Asian Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation, uh, was, was actually founded in 1990 uh, based on uh, a lot of uh, lobbying by Australia uh, and it has 21 member nation states. Uh, including such economic powerhouses as the United States, Japan, and China. So this is politically a very huge economic cooperation. Um, and they count about half of the world's trade. Um, now, it, it's sort of a, a loose cooperation because there's so many countries involved and there's so much uh, political concerns to be wrangled with. But at least it's a start to an even bigger trading uh, block possibly in the future. So, I mean, there are many opportunities to um, when these markets open up, there are many opportunities to expand uh, many uh, American com companies. And the free flow of goods and movements across borders and the harmonization of products and standards and safety features and uh, environmental regulations um, across many countries are going to make trade fairer, uh, make consumers uh, be able to afford and get the most uh, for their money. So there is a lot of benefits uh, to these free, these free trade agreements, a lot of opportunities. But, you know, with opportunities comes threats. Um, there could be these regional trade barriers could start competing more aggressively between each other, between NAFTA and the EU, for example. Um, and uh, that increased competition could really uh, create a lot of trade blockages and tariffs and barriers as well. So we really need to move to, instead of regional trade, uh, more world trade areas. Because, you know, having uh, regional trade fights isn't much better than, you know, uh, national trade fights. Um, so that's it for chapter nine. Um, next chapter, we'll move into foreign exchange markets in chapter 10, and I will uh, talk to you then.